second script we're going to read is called um, The Precipice of Understanding. It's by Amanda Gilpin, who could not make it tonight. She lives in Springfield, Missouri, and was trying to make it here, but couldn't make it. Um, I should say the contest is open to anyone in the states of Missouri or Kansas. Or Kansas. So. And then the third script we're going to read is called uh, Golden Acres Split Decision by Jason Fox, who is sitting way back in the back. <laughs> and collect your ballots, we will um, invite the two player up, the screenwriters up here and let you ask questions and, and, uh, and rip their scripts apart. Have fun. Okay. Or praise them hot. That would be good. Um, now, the readers tonight, we have um, Tara Varney. Paul Burns. Stephanie Cullen. to his eye. He quickly opens the curtain and tapes Juliet in mid-shampoo. Her eyes are tightly shut. He tapes her from head to toe, back and front. Buck, what are you doing? Smile from the camera. You're naked in Paris, babe. Juliet opens her eyes widely, but shampoo suds roll right into them. She shuts her eyes again and rinses her face. Ow! Damn it! That stings! Turn that camera off! It's, it's off, right? You wouldn't dare take me naked. <coughs> Buck turns the camera off as Juliet desopes her head. It's just ten seconds from the waist up. The chicks and cans showed me much more. Juliet turns off the shower and grabs a nearby towel. She wipes her face, then wraps herself with the towel. Erase it now. It could end up on the internet. Come on, it's not kinky. It's just, it's just a little ten second souvenir for me. Juliet steps out of the shower and walks to a pile of clothes on the bed. She dresses as Buck watches her. Erase it. Find another souvenir. I can't even get a t-shirt in this weird-ass country. Nothing fits. Frenchmen are spider monkeys. No, American men are gorillas. Erase it. Buck, still holding the camera, jumps onto the bed. How could you be French, yet be such a prude? Half French. My Irish side will kick your ass if you don't tape over that. Buck looks at his watch. What time do we meet your uncle? Juliet looks at her watch in panic. She's almost dressed. Damn it! In 30 minutes, we'll have to catch a cab. Juliet buckles her belt, grabs her purse, and looks at Buck. Come on! Buck looks at the video camera still in his hand. He grins. He grabs the camera bag and follows Juliet out the door. Exterior. Sacre coeur de Montmartre. Paris. Day. <laughs> Way above Paris. Juliet and Buck stand on the front steps of Montmartre. Crowning glory. 
Juliet scans the scene for her uncle while Buck plays a video game on his Palm Pilot. Juliet nudges Buck and points to the view of Paris. Buck, come on, we're on Montmartre. Look at Paris. Look at that sunset. This must be how it was for Renoir. Buck is in a zone. He doesn't take his eyes off the Palm Pilot. Wait, I'm on a new level. Buck! I've never been this high. Will you wait? Just then, Juliet spots her Uncle Luke, who looks about 50. He's thin, tall for a French man, yet 100% Parisian. When he opens his mouth, his fair to shaky command of the English language is shrouded with a thick accent. Juliet! Juliet, hello, bonjour! Uncle Luke, bonjour! Buck looks a little miffed that he has to give up his electronic game. He feigns a smile. Buck watches smiley Uncle Luke hug Juliet, then kiss her on the right cheek. Buck readies himself. He puts out his hand for a shake with Uncle Luke. But then Uncle Luke kisses Juliet on the left cheek. Buck extends his hand closer, but then Uncle Luke kisses her right cheek again. Then Uncle Luke kisses her left cheek once more. Finally, Uncle Luke notices Buck and shakes his hand. Ah, oh, jerk. <laughs> Uncle Luke inadvertently pronounces Buck's name with the long O vowel. I see mayor. You must be Book. <laughs> it's Buck. Uck. Rhymes with Buck. Hey, he heard you. <laughs> no, I'm a Republican. Uncle Luke gives Buck a quick, strange look, then regains his smile. Then I was busy in Greece. We? I need to practice. So. You have finished law school, my Juliet. Juliet smiles and nods. Uncle Luke puts his arm around Juliet's shoulder and gestures at Buck to follow. Come, we celebrate! I will take you to my restaurant, Farid de Mama. Then I will drive you to Paris for an automobile tour. Juliet looks back at Buck, who has a crabby face. Buck, a personal tour of the City of Lights can't be that. Oh, no, you can't, can you? Uncle Luke <laughs> speaks in a low voice in French to Juliet. Subtitle, is this the dude your father wants you to dump? <laughs> Juliet looks back at Buck again, who squints suspiciously at Uncle Luke. She turns to her uncle and frowns. Oui. Subtitle, bingo. <laughs> uncle Luke shrugs it off, smiles, and says to both, Chez Jean has a menu of excellence, pâté de foie, escargot, moule. Buck looks serious and not a bit self-conscious when he says, I'm dying for a cheeseburger. Uncle Luke suavely whispers to Juliette, Your father is a smart man. <laughs> Exterior, narrow street, Montmartre, night. Uncle Luke, Juliette, and Buck Walk closely on the narrow sidewalk. Uncle Luke is a few steps ahead of the couple. He studies the cars parked along the street and points ahead. Ah, yes. My car is just up there. Thank you again for dinner, Uncle Luke. It was delicious. Juliet nudges Buck, who looks like a bored teenager. Oh, yeah, yes. Thank you, Luke. Uh, it was very uh, Europe-like. <laughs> Uncle Luke stops before a tiny Citroen. He puts his hand on the roof. And Maca. Buck's eyes bug out. Uncle Luke reaches for the keys in his pocket and unlocks the passenger door. Buck bends his six foot four inch frame to peek inside. Buck looks at Juliet, who smiles at him nervously. Uncle Luke curiously watches the hesitating couple. Juliet forces a pleasant smile. I need advanced yoga to fit in that thing. <laughs> Look, sit in the back and angle your legs to the other side. I'll, I'll sit in front with Uncle Luke. Uncle Luke walks to the driver's side and lets himself in. Buck mumbles to Juliet. I have shoes bigger than this car. What's with you today? I'm sick of this country. Not one thing here is bigger than a can of tuna. Interior, exterior, Uncle Luke's car, moving night. Buck sits side saddle in the back seat with a sour face. Uncle Luke drives as Juliet takes in the sights from the front passenger seat. Kids, I'm showing you now a ruse and an ease. Juliet, do not tell your father we visit here. Why not? <laughs> this is the Avenue of the Prostitutes and the Pornographic Directives. It's a humorous to show these tourists. 
Buck at last perks up. He unzips the camera bag, takes out the video camera, and unrolls his window. Juliet and Uncle Luke seem to have grown oblivious to Buck. They smile and laugh as they take in the saucy sights. Buck turns on the video camera and points it at the hookers lining the street. The car slowly rolls along with the heavy traffic. Pretty amazing. Uncle Luke stops for a red light. A sharp-eyed hooker glances over to Uncle Luke's car and spots Uncle Luke and spots Buck aiming the camera in her direction. She points at him and screams. Hey, hey, hey! Video! Suddenly, a swarm of prostitutes and pimps surround the car. Uncle Luke and Juliet look confused. A few hookers start pounding on the hood and trunk of the car. Uncle Luke, what's wrong? What do they want? Mad! Subtitle, shit. <laughs> One hooker reaches in the back window and reaches for Buck's video camera. Buck won't let go. A tug of war ensues as other hookers punch Buck's arm. The frog bitches are trying to steal my camera. That's what they want. <laughs> Uncle Luke jumps out of the car and yells at the hookers and pimps in sonic boom French. Juliet struggles to listen. Uncle Luke yells to Buck through an open car window. Buck! Give him the title of your camera! Send him up to sign to be filmed as his work! Buck scrambles to get the tape out. He hands it to a hooker, but they're still yelling at him and hitting his arm. Uncle Luke gets between Buck in the car and the hookers. Listen to the tequil! Send stupid police to my car! Subtitle. <laughs> Leave him alone! He's a dumbass American! <laughs> the hookers get silent, look at Buck, and in unison say, Ah, oh, wee! <laughs> they walk off giggling. Uncle Luke remains on the street. He examines the outside of his car and shouts French expletives. Bear! Juliet turns around to look at Buck. She's furious. You just gave away our whole European vacation, idiot! What possessed you to take those prostitutes? Uncle Luke is visible through the windshield. He's examining the car hood. He's still shouting expletives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? It's, it's not like that girl's gone vile crap. They were dressed. Not even one boom shot. At that, Juliet gasps. She looks mortified. Oh, Buck. You erased the shower thing from today, right? It's not on that tape, right? Buck looks at her, then out the window. Well, didn't have a chance. You're in such a rush to meet Uncle Marcel Marcel. <laughs> if that tape gets in the wrong hands, it could ruin my career. I, I have political aspirations? A visibly miffed Uncle Luke jumps back into the driver's seat. Juliet shuts up, turns back around to face ahead. She's equally miffed. Uncle Luke peels out, turns up a side street, and drives like a real Parisian. We must find a gendarme. The damage is my car! Are you fine, Juliet? Yes, but I need that tape back. Uncle Luke waves it off. Ah, oh, you will never get that tape again. Those women say a tigresses. Buck suddenly burst out in uncontrollable laughter. Juliet, you might become the next porn star of Paris. Juliet shoots Buck a clampet look, but Uncle Luke catches on immediately. He slams on the brakes and looks at both of them. He addresses Buck with a furious tone. Uh, Buck rolls his eyes. Just ten seconds of Juliet in the shower. Uncle Luke's eyes suddenly look homicidal. They lock on Buck's, as if Luke senses there's something more. A protective uncle's instinct grabs. <coughs> Uncle Luke swiftly pulls a gun out of his jacket, reaches across the back of the car, and holds it against Buck's forehead. Juliet gasps. Uncle Luke, what are you doing? Why do you have a gun? You're fresh! <laughs> Buck's eyes bug out. He freaks. He holds his head steady and confesses to Juliet. Okay, okay, okay. I taped a bit of last night after the champagne and the camera was on the dresser. I uh, left it rolling. Juliet screams. Uncle Luke turns forward and hits the gas. He drives through the streets like a maniac while holding the gun on top of the steering wheel. <laughs> Damn it, slow down! Juliet cries. Buck looks behind, out the back window. Shit, you just passed three cop cars and ignored you. Where are you going? To drop you off. Buck gulps. Where? Where you been all? <laughs> Buck sweats with fear. The car now whizzes along the Champs-Élysées twice as fast as any Parisian cab. Uncle Luke pulls up on the sidewalk. 
Pedestrians jump out of the way. The Citroen bumper hits a large window front. Glass shatters. Buck's eyes are wide open in disbelief. Uncle Luke puts the gun back in his jacket. He gets out of the car, opens the back door, and pulls Buck out of the vehicle. He pushes Buck into the storefront. Some people inside stare in shock. Other Parisians shrug it off. Uncle Luke hops back in the car to a sobbing Juliet. He reverses the car off the sidewalk, back onto the street, revealing that he threw Buck into the Champs-Élysées McDonald's. <laughs> Uncle Luke, still driving, glances at teary Juliet. I'll take you to a new hotel, because then I will get the tap for you. How? It's the same way I just broken a dozen laws without getting arrested. Juliet studies him. <laughs> Once and for all, what do you do for a living? Uncle Luke does not answer her question. Juliet looks down at her purse. No. I have Buck's passport. Give it to her. I will do it to Juliet hands Uncle Luke Buck's passport. He won't do well alone in this city. He only knows how to say how much is the beer and where's the bathroom. Yes, and he will have to drink beer and pee until he gets on the plane. <laughs> Interior, Swank Paris Hotel, Lobby, Night. Uncle Luke and Juliet are by the registration desk. <clears throat> Uncle Luke kisses Juliet's right cheek. Left cheek, right cheek, left cheek. You sleep well. I will take care of everything. I'm so sorry all of this happened. Uncle Luke shrugs and blows air through his lips in a casual, no big deal fashion. Roger, it is not like anyone burns a Chateaubriand. This is nothing. Your car is dented, a window is broken, I'm a porn star, and you're about to go hunting for tigresses in a very bad neighborhood. I have a gun. You are my niece and my goddaughter. I do not see a problem. Good night, Julian. Bonsoir. Yeah. Sometimes I forget you're my godfather, too. Uncle Luke holds Juliet's face, kisses her forehead, turns and walks to the lobby door. She watches him and calls out just before he exits. Uncle Luke! Me? Uncle Luke turns around. The Italians have nothing over you. Uncle Luke smiles, winks at her, and exits into the night. Exit Pont de Nuit, Paris night. A dented citron whizzes over the bridge. Without slowing down, the driver throws something out of the window. It flies beyond the bridge walls to the water below. Exterior, Seine River, Paris, continuous. A small document splashes into the black water. It's an American passport, made out. <laughs> Insert. Computer screen. 
The epitome, the absolute precipice of human understanding and worldly beauty was, end of insert. The muffled female laughter becomes louder, but turns into moans. Lyman runs a hand through his disheveled hair. A steady thumping shakes the walls, neighbors having sex. Precipice of understanding and beauty is... The female's cries of pleasure spike. The few framed movie posters on Lyman's walls rattle with the screams and thuds. I never liked the girl downstairs. <laughs> Lyman rummages in a closet, extracts a baseball bat, bangs on the floor violently. For a moment, silence. He puts the bat away and sits down, places his hands on the keyboard. The laughter and thuds erupt suddenly in full force. Obviously now feigned by the neighbor to annoy Lyman, he stares motionless into the camera, his eye twitches. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, day. Lyman searches the refrigerator with little interest. The freakishly loud and clear sounds of Richard Simmons' is sweating to the oldies blare from below. I didn't choose to be a writer. Most days I'd rather stab myself in the eye with a golf tee than sit in front of a blank screen. Finds nothing, moves to a cabinet, snacks and dry foods. <clears throat> I do it because I have to write. Because the stories in my head have to be told. If I don't write them, they plague my dreams. Lyman wanders into the living room empty-handed, plops down before his monitor, doesn't look at it, entwines his hands in the collar of his robe. I tend to have a second voice in my head while I write. Both a narrator and a constant critic, and he never shake. A voice that helps me push me past writer's block, like a voiceover in my head. His brow furrows. He has the look of someone suffering a migraine. The cheesy workout music raises a notch in volume. I can't hear those voices can't get past my block. Lyman springs from the chair and jumps up and down on the floor, his whole body spasming like a drug drug. I can't hear myself think! For a brief moment during his temper tantrum, Lyman looks as if he's sweating to the oldies too. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom, night. Lyman stares at himself in the mirror, rubs at the fingertips of one hand lightly along the collar of his robe. Numerous loud voices waft from a party below. Lyman looks at the shower with its drawn rubber ducky curtain, cocks his head to the side. A bullhorn rests on the counter, reaches for it without a glance backward, kneels over another vent, speaks into the bullhorn. This is the police. Come out with your hands up. I repeat, this is the police. We have you surrounded. <laughs> he laughs crudely. Interior Lyman's apartment, living room, day. Lyman still hasn't showered, paces back and forth in front of the computer, occasionally glances at words on the monitor, constant moans and shouts pulse in the background. She played every moment of my day. I couldn't get her voice out of my head. Enrique! Enrique! Harder my sorrow! Harder my sorrow! Lyman fumbles with the door's locks, negotiates them, throws open the door, barges into the hall screaming. I know you can hear me, you whore! I hear you fucking all day and night! You hear me screaming? Give me the ass! <laughs> Lyman notices his neighbor across the hall stands petrified in her doorway, cordless phone in hand. She has a deer in headlights look upon her face. You got a problem, honey? Something you need to say? Spit it out! Interior, Lyman's apartment, kitchen, day. <laughs> Lyman paces the cramped room, a cordless phone pressed to one ear. He pulls on the neck of his robe absently, still wears the same clothes. A dog yaps incessantly downstairs. Intercut telephone call, Lyman and apartment manager. This is Lyman Rickard in 4B calling again about my neighbor's dog? No, 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 that... That's not acceptable. I called you twice before about that damn dog, but it's still down there, yapping away! I live here too, and I insist you take care of this! Sir, I told you, we followed up on every complaint you lodged. There was never anyone home when we came for visits. No sign, and no dog! No dog? What the hell do you think that is? Lyman holds the phone away from his head. Aim to catch the sounds of barking. Puts it back to his ear. You're telling me that's not a dog? 
Sir, I'm sorry, I don't hear no dog. Lyman slams the phone down on the charger, cuts him off. Exterior apartment, 3B day. Lyman wears the same clothes still, bangs on the downstairs neighbor's door. I couldn't write with all that noise. Had to settle the situation one way or another. <laughs> Loud rock music blares inside. Miss Taylor, let's be adults. Please answer the door. Miss Taylor, it's obvious to your home. Miss Taylor! He pounds harder on the door, still no response, gets angry. Fine! But I've had enough of this, do you hear me? I have had enough! Interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom, day. Lyman stands before his toilet, hand on the knob. He still has not showered or changed clothes. Series of shots. One, the kitchen and bathroom sinks run full blast. Two, a blender whirs unattended. Three, a garbage disposal spits water into the air as it churns. Four, a vacuum sits in the middle of the living room floor, its headlamp on stationary. Lyman flushes his toilet repeatedly with obvious pleasure. <laughs> I decided to give her a taste of her own medicine. See what it's like having a fly buzzing in your ear 24 hours a day! Exterior apartment 4B continues. A petite fist pounds soundlessly on Lyman's front door. Amidst the conglomeration of sounds from inside comes the noise of a flushing toilet. Interior Lyman's apartment continuous. Lyman cups one hand to his ear in mock concern. I can't hear a thing in here, especially someone knocking on the door! Interior Lyman's apartment, living room night. Lyman places a CD in his stereo and presses load. I enjoyed taunting her for a while. Poetic justice is best served with a smile, I say. He stuffs plugs into his ear canals and plops on the couch, grins at the ceiling as loud and coherent music blares from the stereo. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, day. Lyman stands in the middle of the room, bowl and spoon in hand, still in bum attire, gums some Cheerios, stares at a heating vent in the floor. But you can lose control of a situation quickly, and without knowing it why. <clears throat> he steps tentatively toward the grate, peers down at it, leans closer to hear. The girl's voice floats up to him. She sings to herself in, in the honest way one might when unknowingly being observed. Lyman sets his bowl of cereal on the floor and lowers himself down until he's lying flat, his ear to the grate. The computer sits nearby forgotten. Insert. There is only one new line typed directly below the precipice line on the computer screen. Blah, 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 blah. And some more blah, blah, blah for good measure. End of insert. One obsession can be replaced by another, it seems. Interior, exterior, Lyman's apartment, living room, and balcony day. Lyman peers around the corner of the curtain. Through the slots in the balcony, he sees the top of a girl's head disappear into the driver's side of a car. The car pulls out of the parking lot. Lyman pushes back the curtain and sliding door, creeps onto the deck, clutches a sack full of rotten tomatoes. He glances around suspiciously, sees no one, Chucks the tomatoes at the base of the girl's sliding door on the balcony below his. They splatter one by one in a big mess. It started out as a struggle between me and someone distracting me from writing. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, night. Lyman stares around the edge of the curtain in the dark, puffs madly on his cigarette, <coughs> and keeping vigil. Headlights slice through the darkness as someone swings a car into a parking spot below. Lyman jerks into action, stumbles over his own feet as he tries to get up too quickly. But at some point I realized she wasn't simply a distraction. He dashes for the door, trips over something in the dark, gets the door unlocked. Exterior hallway, night. Lyman practically jumps down the stairs, rounds the banister, reaches for the door of apartment 3B, gets there just as it clicks shut, and a deadbolt snaps inside. He stands in front of the door, emotionless. There is no sound from inside. He stares at the closed door. She was my writer's block. Exterior hallway, later. Lyman leans heavily against the metal railing of the stairs on the landing between the third and fourth floors, gazes into the parking lot in a daze. The sounds of Speak to Me from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon trickle loudly from apartment 3B. The sound of the song's heartbeat rhythm punctuates the night silence, slides into hysterical screams. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom, later. Lyman again examines himself in the mirror, more haggard than ever before. 
Looks as if he hasn't showered in months. I couldn't hear the voices in my head when they were distracting me. And it was lonely without them. Quiet. There is a loud drip of a faucet leaking a drop into a full tub. It echoes in the small bathroom. Lyman jerks his head at the sound, looks at the drawn curtain. It's too quiet. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bedroom night. Lyman lies awake in bed, holding the collar of his robe tight, together at the neck with both hands. Stares at the ceiling, his eye twitches once, twice. But I had to do something. Bells, clocks, and chimes blare as Pink Floyd's time plays below. I had to make the voices come back, to tell me what the end of my story was, what the answer was, what the epitome was. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bedroom, day. Lyman sits at a squat, plain middle table with a wooden chair. He writes a letter by hand. A bouquet of assorted store-bought flowers lies beside the paper. Music ascends through the floor. A woman's voice wails from rising and falling notes in the great gig in the sky from Dark Side of the Moon. Lyman tugs at the collar of his robe. I had to know the end, no matter what, even if it meant swallowing my pride. Exterior, apartment 3B, day. Lyman sets the flowers and envelope outside the door. He dashes back up the stairs and the tails of his robe flying. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, night. Lyman's hands are poised on the keyboard. Doesn't type anything, just sits. Us and them plays downstairs. He twists his fingers into the collar of his robe. The song's lyrics float up to him, peacefully creepy. And who knows which is which and who is who, up and down. And in the end, it's only round and round and round. The music goes silent. Lyman bolts upright in his chair for a moment, nothing, then. Hey, Lyman, Lyme disease, you up there, huh? You up there trying to ride, you little baby? Maybe you should get a real fucking job and leave me the hell alone, you freak. You say I bother you? Well, here you go, freak, eat shit. Music blares back on three times louder than before. Interior, Lyman's apartment, night. In spliced, fragmented shots, Lyman stumbles from room to room, hands over his ears. Snippets of Dark Side of the Moon music play sporadically. He is losing his mind. She's going to kill me. Kill my inspiration, my voice, my sanity. She was the Antichrist I knew. It would never stop. Everything goes black. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, later. Lyman lies sprawled on his back in the middle of the room. The lyrics, <coughs> the lunatic is on the grass, echo in the room as the song Brain Damage plays. Lyman's eyes are closed in a deep sleep, but one eye twitches involuntarily. The music repeats, the lunatic is on the grass. Lyman opens his eyes, sits up groggy, rubs his neck, opens his gummy mouth, Lyman looks around him, then sees the bathroom door ajar, the light on. Lyman hears an echo in his own voice, followed by a laugh. You can lose control of a situation quickly, and without knowing it. He rises and carefully crosses to the door, another echo. One obsession can be replaced by another, it seems. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom, night. Lyman is pale, <coughs> sweats frozen in the bathroom doorway as he looks at the bathtub with the drawn curtain. It suddenly appears ominous. Takes a tentative step into the room. Turns quickly to his left, his reflection in the mirror, frightened. At the sight of his reflection, his own voice whispers through the room as many. They overlap in different pitches and speeds, but they are all variations of a distinct phrase. Epitome. Precipice. Precipice of understanding. <coughs> Precipice of understanding. Lyman hears the echo strain of music. The lunatic is in my head. The voices buzz around him. He steps slowly and shakily to the bathtub curtain, hand outstretched, freezes. But you do know when you lose control. Your hands go clammy, your hair sweats, your legs become rigid, and you're afraid to see inside your bathtub. You know you've lost control. And you know why. <laughs> Lyman turns to face the mirror again, eyes wide. Flashback sequence. Interior, Lyman's apartment, living room, night. 
Lyman stares around the edge of the curtain in the dark. Headlights slice through the darkness. He jerks, stumbles. You realize something is different. Different than you remember. Different than you told yourself. He dashes for the door, trips, gets the door unlocked. Exterior hallway, night. Lyman practically jumps down the stairs, rounds the banister, reaches for the door of the apartment 3B, gets there just before it shuts, pushes easily inside, it clicks shut behind him, and a deadbolt snaps inside. <coughs> Exterior hallway later. Lyman leans against the metal railing of the stairs, raises a cigarette to his lips. His hands are bloody. The sound of speak to me, heartbeat rhythm, punctuates the silence, slides into hysterical screams. Interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom later. Lyman examines himself in the mirror, blood on his collar. End of flashback sequence. Match cut to interior, Lyman's apartment, bathroom night. Lyman stares at his reflection, bug-eyed. He steps slowly and shakily to the bathroom curtain, hand outstretched, tension unbearable, voices raised to a feverish climax. I can't hear those voices. I can't get past my block. She was going to kill my voices. My sanity. His fingertips brush the curtain, slide toward the edge for a grip. I have to know what's behind the curtain to see the wizard. One voice slices through all the others, urgent. The hand tightens on the curtain. The precipice, all beauty and understanding, was... The hand jerks back the curtain, black, the end. Flowers like that in your hair. 
Sits forever. Now go on, or we'll be sitting behind Edna again. Exit Maureen. Maureen opens the door all the way to watch him leave. Camera follows Maureen's gaze. Orlando sidles up behind her. That was close. Too close. <laughs> Get out! Yes, yes, I must avoid this Maureen character and lay, as they say, low. <laughs> On your voiceover, Maureen pushes Orlando out the door and as hastily as she has yanked him in and slams the door behind her. Orlando brushes himself off and heads in the opposite direction of Maury. Maury, however, had decided to risk an angina attack and was waiting for Maureen down the block, thus spotting Orlando. Pan from in front of Maureen's condo down the block to show Maury peeking around the corner and spotting Orlando. Cut to Maury's point of view of the scene. It is blurry as he does not have on his glasses. <laughs> as he left. But since Maury had, in an effort to look good for his date, left his glasses at home, he mistook the blurry figure for his best friend, Reggie. Cut to Maury angrily searching for glasses in his shirt and pants pockets. Reggie. <laughs> Interior Golden Acres Great Room. The Great Room is the hub of social life at Golden Acres. The room is modern and tastefully de decorated. Hanging on one wall is a flat panel plasma television. A full entertainment system, receiver, DVD player, etc. sits underneath it. Nice couches and recliners fill the room. A few com community residents are in the room. Reggie Jackson and Phyllis McGillicuddy are seated on a couch in front of the TV talking. Reggie, at that moment, was busy pitching woo to one Phyllis McGillicuddy, Maureen's best friend. Come on, you need a little blue plate special? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's me look tonight at the park more. Edna Jones. <laughs> Edna Jones, seventies with a huge beehive, enters and attempts to sit down in a chair next to Phyllis. Hey, that's safe. Edna leaves in a huff as Maury enters hurriedly. What's that problem? Her daughter's marrying a mime. <laughs> hey, Lori. Reggie, you certainly move fast. Huh? Enter Maureen. She sits next to Maureen. Thank you, too. Hello, you. Maureen. <laughs> What's your problem? Hey. What's his problem? Maureen grabs a remote and turns on the TV. Seen it? No. Nope. Perfect. What's this? What does it look like? It looks like bowling. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but we always watch the antiquing sideshow. I am not wasting a high definition TV on the sideshow. <clears throat> what has gotten into you? If I want to see something in a high definition, it's going to be a 16th century French armoire like my grandmother had. Your grandmother was from Hoboken. No, she was originally from Lyon. Oh, brother. They came to America so her father could be the first serenettist in Atlantic City. Fascinating. <laughs> What's a serenettist? It's a type of musician. It's an organ grinder. Oh, with a monkey. First monkey in the <laughs> And your people came on the Mayflower? I don't know. Didn't have a monkey. Oh. <laughs> Can we watch the sideshow now? Yeah, Marty, come on. The girls want The girls want to watch this guy pick up a 710 split in ultra sharp, 1080 lines of plasmatronic high definition glory. Right, girls? I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> Is your blood sugar low? I've got some lemon drops in here somewhere. No candy! Enter Orlando. Good day, gentle people. <laughs> Maury. I thought you were laying low. Interior, Orlando's condo a few minutes earlier. Day. Under voiceover. Quick cuts of Orlando in his condo trying to kill some time, e.g. laying down, eating chips, attempting Pilates, etc. <laughs> Orlando exits. Orlando had, in fact, managed to lay low for 33 seconds. <laughs> Interior, Golden Acres Clubhouse. Resume action. How are you, Orlando? Not unwell, thank you. I am pleased to report that this 
ointment is working splendidly. <laughs> Sorry. Would you care to join us? Yeah, Tallahassee, please join us. I could use some honest conversation. What on earth are you rambling about? You and him together. Your blood sugar is low, I knew it. <laughs> Much to Maury's confusion, <coughs> Maury had hypertension, not hypoglycemia. <laughs> What's he talking about, Reginald? I have no idea. Don't play dumb with me, Reggie Jackson. <laughs> They're both there? No relation. I saw you coming out of her condo not ten minutes ago. What? He was with me all morning. Orlando starts to back away from the room. Sensing a turning of the tide, Orlando attempted a hasty retreat. Well, I see that you are all quite busy. Uh, what with watching the rolling art that is bowling and all, I, I, uh, I really must attend to my roses. Excuse me. Exit Orlando. Only to cast to all suspicion upon himself. Roses. Cut to flashback of Maury complimenting Maureen on the rose in her hair. Since when do you wear flowers and get like that? Flowers like that. Flowers like that. Cut to present. <laughs> Lando! Maury gets to his feet and hustles out of the scene. What? Orlando! Here we go. Exterior Golden Acres Clubhouse Day. Orlando is driving away in a golf, court, golf cart as Maury gets into another golf cart and a low speed chase ensues. <laughs> Maureen, Phyllis, and Reggie watch from the sidewalk. What do you think he'll do when he catches him? He won't. He's not wearing his glasses. <laughs> As Orlando turns his cart to the right out of the clubhouse drive, Maury turns his to the left, knocking over a mailbox and chasing after a bewildered golfer. <laughs> the end faded black. <laughs> You want to fill out your ballots? Uh, uh, so we're both collecting it? Yeah, I'll collect Just while we collect, he's going to get the screen right. Okay.
What was it like to see your friends? What was it like listening to your words, seeing these people do it? It was fun. Were you surprised by any of the turns? Uh, no, it, it kind of turned out the way I thought it was. Good. Um, I was somewhat surprised because I always have um, self-direct everything that I write. So without uh, being involved in any way with what happened, it was, it was pretty, pretty fun to see someone else. Read it. Was uh, the tone the way you expected? Yeah. Yeah. It came through really well. What was your impetus for writing Golden Anger? <laughs> <laughs> it actually started out as a, a paid assignment that fell through. So um, it became my own. So I kind of edited out all the parts that uh, mentioned people that were paying for it. <laughs> no, no. He was all for it. Retire. I love from inception until you considered it ready to be read. Yeah. Um. Well, we just had a deadline, and I kind of did it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. Um. Well, actually, I, I wrote two short screenplays just for this contest, and um. The other one I worked on for a long time, and then this one I did every day. <laughs> but it, mine was, uh, I'm embarrassed to say this, but it was based on something that really happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> did Buck ever make it back? <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in Paris, there is a picture of I think I downloaded a videotape. <laughs> a videotape of me in the shower. I knew <laughs> It's a lot to go through, but it's worth the trip, I guess. <laughs> no, that that was me. I embellished. It was great. Yeah. And, and my uncle did not have a gun. <laughs> I hope he's not like a French mom. You did dump the guy, right? Yes, yeah, good time. Do you have to pass the same to say? I've had part of the same. No, I don't know where he is now, but. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> That's very lovely. I'll ask a tough question. All right, tough question. How do you plan on making this if you don't go to Paris? Um, well, I have relatives in Paris. Um, and actually, my uncle Luke, he's really uncle Dundee, has an interview. Well, better excuse than to go to Paris <laughs> to make a film. <laughs> Yeah. 
some of the playoffs is something that would cost a lot of money. Thanks for having us together. Thank you. 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 shoots or had any first-hand experience with filmmaking other than script writing? I used to work on television. I was a producer. Um, I did all kinds of things for television, mainly promotion. Um, I also produced a country music video show when I lived in Oklahoma. Um, but not, not an independent film. I haven't been anywhere with um, independent film. I'm a writer at an ad agency here in town, so I've been on a lot of shoots around. So, as, uh, as the writer of the script, you, yes. you show up on the shoot in no, case we, you need to tweak it no, and we, such. We have, you have a lot more power in the ad industry as the writer than you would actually as a screenwriter. If you're successful, you make a whole lot more money as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're the writer of an ad, it's you and your art director that basically get to control everything. So that's nice. <laughs> well, he's right though. I mean, a lot of people have changed setups because the writer got a whim or something on the set. I know I had to change the lights around. Yeah, one out there. Did you point at somebody? Did you have somebody else? No, there? I just pointed at him. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Making it feel better. <laughs> Any more questions from anyone? Yes. Besides yourself, who's based on something? When you were writing it, could you see any famous actress being in the shower, like Sarah Jessica or something like that? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't really picture. Uh, I, you know, it just kind of happened to me, and I just made myself a redhead for this. <laughs> <laughs> just to disguise myself, but, uh, a clever disguise. Uh, but no, I, I didn't really, you know, and I, because it happened, I, you know, I, it, it, it actually happened and I embellished here and there, but. I pictured the people that, you know, Buck, um, he <laughs> existed, and, um, and uh, my uncle jean -Bean, you know, where is Uncle jean -Bean? Yeah, he did a good job. Um, so, it, you know, with, with something else, though, I, whenever I write other things, I like to picture actors. Um, oh, and before I forget, it's Amy Bissett's birthday today. Happy birthday! <laughs> Uh, we all know one of the scripts was set in Paris. 
and which may or may not make it difficult to produce. You know, when you're in Paris or not. Um, so does the audience see other things in these films that might make it difficult to to, to make? <laughs> Casting on the third one. Casting. Yeah. 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 And getting into all the castings. Though, though not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't buy yeah. green bananas. Music. <laughs> music. We, we in quote, the second one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in the second one, when you quote name piece, boy. Especially that many different cuts, too. Yeah. 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 You might have trouble. The Floyd's going to run you. You might have trouble with McDonald's as well, but you could easily turn that into a cafe. Yeah, Popeyes. White Castle. Burger King's letting you do it for free. Maybe you make it a Scottish place, McDonald's. I, I, I would like to say, though, that the cast did a great job on Golden Acres, and I think that uh, while presumably you're casting all elderly people for elderly roles, I think the cast here, just in the reading, proved that that's not necessarily necessary. Well done. Great voices. Yeah, there's makeup for that. Sorry. I just wanted to answer that age question. I have a list. Of older actors who are my friends who could totally do golden acres. They don't know. Excellent. I don't ever lie to casting art, but I get that a lot. That's a hard task. Well, that's our job is to find people who can do that. We can do that by the director who can pull that out of the figure. Exactly. I think there's plenty of actors in the community here that can pull that out of the Question back here. No, I was going to say, I, my grandmother just moved into a time of home. They have a theater troupe. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, so, officially, <laughs> officially, once again, Joe stands correct and we can find all the other actors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Geriatric theatrics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Hey, no seniors were hurt in the making of this film. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we have to make it. Uh, before I get to the results, and I don't mean to drag this out any further, it was pointed out to me that we were remiss on shameless self-promotion. Those of us that attend every Wednesday night, during the meeting we get shameless self-promotion. It would be a good opportunity for shameless self-promotion for both the writers group as well as ours. And so, if there's anybody in the room that has any shameless self-promotion, now is the time. Before we announce the winners, short and film related. Short and film related would be a good thing. Uh, anyway, yes. Anybody want to re-push any flyers or information they have on the table real quick? Because that would be shameless self-promotion. No? It's the bit ladies and the Action Cut Seminar over there. Hit the table, pick up some mess. www.ifckc.com. Ifckc.com. Volunteer for children. First of all, let's hear it for our casting today. All the Second of all, for our playwrights. Again. All three. It was a very, it was much closer between you two. I'm glad that uh, Amanda's not here, actually. And uh, the, the third one, Golden Acres, actually won. Yeah. Well, I guess I needed more fanfare, but that was it. And we're, the winner is. <laughs> Here's the our prize. Uh, no, it was close, but no tiebreaker required. Although. This isn't Florida. Everything's on the up and up. They're all right here. Turn them over to the most trustworthy guy I know, Brian. And comments are on there in case you want to look at them. And there's a count on the back of the one. Can we hear the challenge? Okay. The Republicans can I'm not going to say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, now the other prize. Um, that was the IFC prize. Now we go to the KC Screenwriters prize. And all I want to say about this prize is um, a finalist from the first year um, named John Thonin passed away earlier this year. And we read his script. And we decided that in honor of John Thonin, we would name our award hereafter the Fifi. <laughs> so the Fifi goes to. The Precipice of Understanding by Amanda Gilpin. Chairs there. I wonder. 